Assemble the world's four greatest heroes, created from the cosmic legends of the universe. Well, hey, folks, you are not listening to just another fanboy. No, this is my other podcast, episode number 224 DC versus Vampires, issue number four. Welcome to another episode of my other podcast. My name is Steven. I'm your host. This is the podcast, of course, that I do for all the good folks over on my Patreon. But today we're talking about DC versus Vampires issue number four. And just a couple things I want to say before we really get into the actual issue. These episodes that I've been doing where I've been talking about DC versus Vampires, I've also been putting them out over on the Just Another Fanboy feed, and I'm way behind on this issue. The idea was is that the week that the issue was released, I would talk about it that Friday on my other podcast here for the patrons, and then the week before the or the week before the week of the next issue I'm saying that completely wrong. The week of or the week before the next issue was to be released, then I would put it out over at Just Another Fanboy for for those folks. But because of COVID, I'm way behind, and I'm just now getting around to recording this episode when, uh, you know, the freaking next issue, issue number five, comes out on Tuesday. So for you folks over at the Patreon, you're getting this on Friday For the folks on Just Another Fanboy, you're getting it on Tuesday, the 22nd, and then on the 25th, over over on the Patreon, you guys are going to get issue number five. So you're getting two, for for those of you on on the Patreon, you're getting two DC versus Vampire issues in a row, more than likely, unless something really weird comes up. Anyway, issue number four was, of course, published by DC Comics. Otherwise, it would be called Marvel versus Vampires, but it's not. It's called DC versus Vampires, and it was published on January 25th, 2022. And it was written by James Tynan IV and Matthew Rosenberg with Otto Schmidt on art. So let me read you the, uh, the oh my God, I can't think of the name of it. Why can't I not think of the name of that? The, um, the solicitation, that's what I'm going to read you. Batman has confirmed who in the Justice League has been turned into a vampire, but can he make his move before the Justice League is turned against him? It's hero versus hero in this blood-drenched chapter with clues to who may be the new... I said, good Lord, read that completely wrong. With clues to who the new vampire king might be. End of solicitation. So I wanted to read that because as I was reading the issue today, rereading it through... There was a point in the issue that I was like, oh, wait a minute. Is is this a clue to who the new Vampire King might be? And then I read this freaking uh, solicitation, and it tells me that there will be clues in this issue to who the new Vampire King might be. So we open the issue. I'm going to try to do this without the issue in front of me, because let me, let me complain for a second here, folks. Comixology has uh, officially merged with Amazon. They Amazon has owned Comixology for a while now, but now they're making it so that you have to go to Amazon's website to order your comics. Ultimately, they want everybody to read those comics on the Kindle, but they did release a new version of the Comixology app uh, today, the day that I'm recording this. And I'm not not a big fan of the new Comixology app. It's made somewhat like the Kindle, which makes it very difficult for me to find the books that I've been reading. And it's the Comixology have had this thing on it called Smart Lists, which was just rows of the comics, the the ones you're reading, the ones you've downloaded, the ones you've bought, the ones that you haven't read yet, the ones that uh, haven't been downloaded yet, those that are in your Comixology Unlimited queue. Anyway, I'm not really here to talk about the the app. I'm mainly uh, more upset about the website because when I would record these episodes, 
I would go to the Comixology website and I could log in and go to where my books are and, and look, read the comics on the computer, which is much more handy because I have this giant freaking widescreen monitor just right in front of my face. And it's easier to have the comic book in front of me on that screen than to pull it up on my um, tablet, which I suppose I could do. I'll just I just had to get used to that anyway. So I'm just not even going to do it just in protest. I'm just going to talk about the book from a memory, but I just read it like 30 minutes ago. So my memory should be fairly sharp. So anyway, we open in the, I think it's called the oblivion bar. It's the bar where all the fricking uh, magic users in the DC universe hang out. It's like in its own little pocket universe or something. And John Constantine is there and Zatanna comes to see him and she wants to talk to him in private. And so they go into a private room and we learn that Zatan is a vampire and she's about to sink her fangs into John who has his back to her. But he kind of flippantly puts a little spell on her over his shoulder because he knows she's a vampire and he just didn't want to kill her because she's still his friend. And who else is he going to complain to about life? Uh, so they get to talking and he's asking her, you know, like what it's what's it what's it like to be dead and. She's like, oh, it's wonderful. You should join us. And then suddenly Dr. Fate shows up and kills or destroys Zatanna because, of course, vampires are already dead. John Constantine is very upset about this because even though she was a vampire, she was still his friend. Um, we get some great moments in the Batcave. Batman is is doing some research and he's he's on, uh, you know, in front of his uh, 17 different freaking giant screens. And he's asking Alfred to get him samples from from blood banks and, and whatnot. And then suddenly he realizes that something's wrong. And he says a code phrase to, to Alfred. I think it's something like, uh, oh, I just realized that it's raining or something like that. And then Alfred's like, all right, and I will do that now. And suddenly all the lights go off in the bat cave, except for the monitors, which are now blank, but they're still shining some light out of them. Well, Oliver has come. He has broken in. Oliver Green Arrow has broken into the Batcave to kill Batman because Green Arrow thinks that Batman is a vampire and Batman thinks that Green Arrow is a vampire. And so the two of them start fighting. And it's a really it's really a great scene because you see the Green Arrow creeping around in the Batcave and you see Batman standing in front of his monitors and then Green Arrow shoots an arrow at him and it, and it hits hits Batman and Batman falls to the ground Green Arrow runs over and realizes that it's just a dummy with the uh, with the bat with the bat cowl thrown over the dummy's head. And Green Arrow's like, oh, this is bad. And then the two just start fighting. And the thing I think I like the most about it is that Green Arrow held his own against Batman. I really appreciated that, Mr. Tynan in Rosenberg. It's too often these days that people just build up Batman as just this ultimate fighting dude who can take out anybody from the Flash to Superman to Dark Side. And and it was nice to see Green Arrow holding his own against him. And at one point, the uh, Ollie Green Arrow shoots and it shoots an arrow. Uh, <laughs> funnily enough, surprisingly, the Green Arrow shoots an arrow at Batman and it's got a little glass ball for the uh, the arrowhead and. The ball shatters when it hits Batman and he's drenched in water and Batman jumps on Oliver and he tries to stake him with a wooden stake. And Batman's like, why did you shoot an arrow full of water at me? And and all he says, it's holy water. Why are you trying to to stake me? And that's when they both realize neither one of them is a vampire and they're they're buddies again at that point. And they, they try to pool their information when an alarm goes off that somebody is breaking into the Batcave. But before we get to that, as the two of them are in the Batcave talking, um, Batman reveals to Oliver, to Green Arrow, that the Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, has been converted. He is a vampire, and that he killed Barry Allen, the Flash. And Ollie is really kind of upset about that because he and Hal are good buddies. And uh, as they're talking, we're getting these... Uh, other scenes that are are interspersed in there during their conversation. One of them is with Batgirl and Nightwing, where she has broken into a, a hotel room and she's found dirt underneath a bed. And Nightwing comes in and she tells uh, Nightwing that vampires 
if they are going from their country of origin to another country, they have to sleep in a sleep above the uh, dirt from their country of origin or something like that. And they determined that uh, it, that Mary, Queen of Blood, might have stayed in this hotel room. But we were told at the very beginning of this book that the Mary, Queen of Blood, is dead. And that's what started this whole vampire war against humanity and has created a new vampire king because she was the one that was in control of the vampires and she was keeping them at bay. She was, she had, had uh, created a, a, a truce kind of a, a peace between vampires and, and humankind. Well, we also get a scene with Jason Todd and the other bat girl. There's, there's like seven different bat girls and like nine different Robins in the DC universe. The bat girl that has the full face mask, Cassandra Kane, I think her name is, and they're fighting a couple of villains. Um, and as they're fighting them, and and Jason Todd kills one of them, stake to the heart, because they're vampires. And the other one is like a... I, they don't actually say if it's Gorilla Grodd. It could be just another gorilla from Gorilla City, but it is a vampire. And and uh, the gorilla escapes. And Cassandra Kane tells Jason Todd that she found something, and she shows him a playing card and it's the Joker card. But as we're seeing this panel, we're 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 given uh, caption boxes or or text boxes of the conversation that Oliver and Bruce are having, Batman and, and Green Arrow. And at one point, um, there they mention the new Vampire King, and it happens to be that panel when Batman is speaking about you know learning who the new Vampire King is, where we're being shown the Joker card. So. That was that's my clue. That's what I'm thinking at this point is that the Joker is the new vampire king, which just sounds insane. But I guess if any villain is going to is going to get all the vampires, you know, become a vampire and then decide we're going to kill all of humanity. The Joker is probably the one who's 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 most likely to step up and just create that kind of chaos rather than try to use it to his advantage and uh you know, maybe rule a nation or something. I, I, I don't know. I'm just I'm postulating at this point. But that seemed like a fairly overt clue. Well, in the meantime, Wonder Woman breaks into the Batcave. We know as of the previous issue that Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern, has turned Wonder Woman into a vampire and that the two of them went to see the Justice League to tell them that Batman was the one who killed Barry Allen the Flash. And so Wonder Woman breaks into the Batcave and she is she's she's telling both Batman and Green Arrow that she understands that that uh, they had no choice, that they are infected, that it's a sickness and they will try. She, you know, she'll try to help them in any way possible. Basically, just uh, stick into the story that the two of them are vampires well, Batman and Green Arrow decide, of course, they're going to fight back because they don't want to die. And Hal Jordan shows up and they tussle for a bit. And that's when the rest of the Justice League shows up. Now, I'm going to still assume at this point that it's only Hal and Wonder Woman that are vampires and that the rest of the Justice League are just being duped by the two of them into believing that Batman and Green Arrow are both vampires because they've been having these meetings you know, especially after, um, well, from issue one, when uh, the I vampire guy showed up and then when Barry Allen was killed, the Justice League have have gathered to try to find out who killed Barry Allen. Well, Bruce, Batman and Oliver, Green Arrow, they don't show up to any of these meetings. And so they're using that Wonder Woman and, and Green Lantern are using the, their absences to convince the rest of the Justice League that the two of them are vampires. And that's that's how the issue ends, because Superman and the rest of the Justice League show up and Bruce says, are you here for us or are you here for them? And Superman says something to the effect of we're, we're here to help you, Bruce. You know, we're here to, here to help you get better or something like that. And uh, that's when we realize that that Batman and, and Green Arrow are going to have to fight the Justice League. And that's kind of where it ends. This, again, this was probably my favorite of the four issues so far. I really enjoyed the fact that Green Arrow and Batman have now hooked up and they're obviously going to team up and start killing some vampires, which was the the, the whole uh, 
cover of issue number one, that's what it portrayed was Batman and Green Arrow killing vampires. And that's the one thing I've been looking forward to most is seeing the two of them get together and start killing them some vamps because I'm not a big fan of the vampires. But um, the the whole idea now at this point that uh, you just really don't know who is a vampire and who isn't unless you're told in the story that a certain hero or villain is a vampire, then the others, if you're not told, for example, the Justice League, I don't know if any of the, some of them may, may very well be vampires or they may just be regular people or regular superpowered people who are being duped by Hal and Diana Wonder Woman. It's uh, it's gosh, it's so much fun. It's such a great book and it's so beautiful to look at. Otto Schmidt. I don't know what I, I mean. He needs to be on a on a Green Arrow book. And I know he was when they did the whole rebirth thing. The first like six issues uh, was Otto Schmidt. But I think he needs to go back. Here's here's what I'd like to see. I'm just going to I'm just going to put this out there. This doesn't have anything to do with the book we're talking about. But in my dream DC world, I want to see Tom Taylor and Bruno Redondo do a Ted Cord Blue Beetle book. And I want to see James Tyne in the fourth and Otto Schmidt do a Green Arrow book. Or I make jokes about this, but I think it would be fun to have a team of heroes that are all that all have colors in their name. Green Arrow, Green Lantern, Black Adam, Black Canary, Black Lightning. Did I say Blue Beetle already? I think I did. Red Tornado. You know, there's a lot of them. I think that'd be fun. Call them the the the, the Rainbow Group or something. Anyway, um, this book, if you're reading along, let me know because it's it's a lot of fun. If you're on the, the Patreon and you want to leave a comment there on the Patreon, you can do that. Or if you're listening to this through Just Another Fanboy, you can send me an email at justanotherfanboy.com and uh, tell me tell me who you think the Vampire King is. It's it, it it's I mean, it's got to mean something that the solicitation actually refers to them as the king and not the queen. Or not even, uh, they don't even try to be gender neutral and say who the new vampire leader is. They're, it's like, are, you know, is that a red herring? Are they trying to trick us by saying vampire king and it's really a woman? Or I, I don't know. I feel like uh, I feel like somebody slipped up here, I think. And I'm, and, and I'm assuming at this point that it is the Joker. And really, we are only four issues into a 12-issue series. So there's so much more that is going to happen in this series. We're just, we're, we are a third of the way through. We still have two thirds of the story left. And I just, I can't imagine how much further we're going to go as far as, you know, what, is this going to end up like the, the, the deceased books? Is this going to be in this universe, something that changes the world forever? Are we going to see some cataclysmic type tragedies happening in this world? Or are we going to see more big heroes turned into vampires. I don't know. I, I just, I'm just really happy to be reading this. And uh, I don't know really what else to say about it. There were some, some fun moments in it. The the scene with uh, Nightwing and Batgirl were really fun because at one point she, uh, I'm actually going to, going to pull it up because it's a really good line. All right. So they're, they're in the hotel room. Batgirl finds the dirt under the bed and she tells Nightwing that it's ancestral dirt. His response is, I'm not as familiar with the different types of dirt as I'd like. And she explains to him what ancestral dirt is. When a vampire travels, they must sleep above dirt from their ancestral home. And then he tells her that she checked in with the hotel and found out that this room was booked for a long term stay to a Mary Shackton. And Nightwing's response is, it's not that I never have a clue what you're talking about that bothers me. I just feel like I'm letting you down when I don't go, ooh, after you say stuff like that. And then she explains that Shackton is the maiden name of Mary Seward's brother. Mary Seward is Mary, Queen of Blood, who was the ruler of the, va the vampires. And so they think that she came a traveling to Gotham. And maybe that's where she was killed. We don't know. But it was... That's the, it's one of the things that I really, really enjoy about this book. There are horrifically violent moments in this book because you cannot fight vampires without killing them. And vampires cannot fight you without drawing blood of some sort. And uh, 
so there's just these really like horrifically violent, bloody scenes. These very these very serious, uh, dark scene, you know, types of scenes, and then there are just these wonderful moments of humor that are just mixed in uh, with you know everything else. And I've always appreciated that about stories, especially when it's done right. And James Tynan and Matthew Rosenberg, they do it correctly, especially when you combine it with Otto Schmidt's art. I think there are some writers out there that do try to mix the comedic moments in with the more serious moments, but they oftentimes try too hard and it just falls flat. But I think they're doing it spot on in this book so far. So again, are you reading it? Are you enjoying it? Do you hate it? Who do you think the Vampire King is? Let me know. You can send me an email at justanotherfanboy at gmail.com or as a patron, you can leave a comment there on the Patreon or you can email me either way. Uh, before I let you all go, uh, I just want to remind everybody that I started a new newsletter over at the Substack. It's a really neat kind of service. Um, I'm using the free option, meaning that you can j- join my Substack and subscribe to my newsletter for free. And anytime I put up a new episode, I also put it up over there on the Substack and it sends the episode to your inbox if you are subscribed. Now, the neat thing about that is, is because I have set it up to do a podcast on the Substack, it actually assigns just another fanboy. It assigns these episodes to its, it it, it creates its own RSS feed. And when you get the email, Right up on right up top of the email under the title of the episode, you get a little widget type thing where you can play the episode there in the email. I think it actually opens up to a separate web page. But there's a link in there that says, you know, right below it, this is listen in podcast app. So if you're looking at this on your phone, for example, you click that 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 link, tap that link and it will uh, it will take that RSS feed and it'll move it to various podcasting apps that you could you maybe already have on your phone or you could add to your phone stuff like um, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Overcast, Pocket Casts, Downcast, Castro, and Radio Public. So if you use any of those podcasting apps, Substack, that little link in the email will move that RSS feed for you automatically into the app of your choice And then there it is. You don't have to try to listen to it on the website. You can just listen to the episode through Apple Podcasts, for example. And every new episode that comes out, well, we'll, you can listen to it there as well. And it's it's just I think it's a neat service because every new episode that I put out, it's going to be waiting for you in your inbox when you wake up that morning. So go to justanotherfanboy.substack.com. The link will be in the show notes and sign up for the newsletter. It's It's free. It's completely free. And every episode that I put out, whether it's just another fanboy or event or else or whatever, is going to go right to your email address. And then anything else I put up, web comics, blog posts, whatever, it's just going to be sent directly to you. It's a it's a it's a no brainer, folks. Just another fanboy dot substack dot com. Link will be in the show notes. That's it, folks. That's the episode. Enjoy your weekend. For those of you who are listening to this on Friday, my patron folks, my loyal patron people. And uh, if you're listening to it on Tuesday through Just Another Fanboy, I hope you have a great week. I'm out.